Okay, uh, let me welcome you to the building construction class with a fire officer. Um, this class is broken up into six segments. This will be the first segment. Um, know the enemy, know the battlefield. We're going to talk about loads, building components, construction types, uh, a few other details. So the PowerPoint is based on Frank Brannigan's Building Construction for the Fire Service. Uh, I'm using the fourth edition through Jones and Bartlett. Uh, if you have other editions of uh, Brannigan's Building Construction for the Fire Service, uh, you can use that. If you have the third edition, that's a good edition, or even a second edition. But this course has been developed to assist the fire officer in his or her decision-making process we're faced with a building collapse or a, or a fire incident. Uh, the class has been developed to meet the New Jersey Division uh, fire safety building construction component for fire officer level one certification. At the completion of the course, the fire officer or future fire officer will have a basic understanding of some building instruction principles. And the course will cover basic building instruction types. Emphasis will be placed on how the fire behavior and building instruction go hand in hand when developing an incident action plan. So unlike a lot of building construction classes, I'm pretty much uh, teaching this class from the perspective of what a fire officer needs to know <clears throat> in order to create an incident action plan uh, based on situations he can anticipate finding based on the building instruction. So there will be some tactical elements um, during the class. Um, there also is going to be some thought, productive thought, some uh, thought requirements into how you as the future fire officer uh, would make decisions based on the type of building construction that you're faced with. So here's a uh, quick video from Chief Vincent Dunn on the battle space. And it gives us a pretty good primer on what we can expect from this class. To a, to a firefighter and a fire officer is all cake is fine. The other lesson you would have to say would be when you do a building inspection, one of the advantages is the visualization of the occupants. You do see the insides of those buildings. Now, you may not have picked up that alteration, but knowing the construction of a building gives you a sense of, uh, of its danger even before a fire. So when I talk about building construction, I like to um, use the analogy of the human body. Right? Um, the human body is made up of bones. All our bones have different um, job requirements to support us, to support our structure as a human being. Same thing with buildings. Buildings have structural elements or structural members. I like to call them the bones of the building. Uh, and there is a hierarchy, so you have to be able to undress the building, just like you can see here of our, our skeleton structure. So you need to know you need to know what the most important bones in the building are, so then you can have an understanding of what some of the dangers you might face um, when it comes to fires in different types of buildings, building occupancies, building structures. So in our uh, knowing the bones of the building, there is a hierarchy, all right? So starting with columns, all right? So all our structural members basically are always subject to gravity. <clears throat> so columns are the, the first and most important building element in any building structure. And columns transfer the load 
down to the foundation. Second are girders. Now girders support the beams of the building. And then our beams support floors and roofs. So um, normally the, the beams can be considered rafters, they're also called floor joists, but they're normally, depending on the span, they're normally being carried by a girder, and the girder is being supported by a column which carries the load down to hopefully a substantial foundation. So let's talk about loads. Loads are forces that are applied to the structure and the structural elements. So we're going to talk about these loads in this uh, part one. So we're talking about compression, we're going to talk about tension, axial loading, torsial loading, shear loading, dead loads, live loads, impact loads, fire loads, and concentrated loads. So loads that are compression. So building elements under compression, there's a steel uh, I-beam supporting a roof structure. It's under compression. Here's a column. This column is under compression. So a little story here with this column. This was in the Crab's Claw restaurant. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that location <clears throat> on the shore in La Valette. But uh, as a uh, technical rescue uh, team commander, we were called out there one night for a, uh, an issue with the uh, possible building collapse with the column. <clears throat> so you can see here, encircled, I have the uh, a lally column, concrete-filled lally column that was um, behind a bar supporting the part of the second floor. What had happened was the loading was, uh, the lally column was undersized for the load that it was trying to carry from the floor above. So at some point it just snapped. So that column is under compression. And if you look down here, there is a there is a formula for columns as far as the the amount of load that a column can carry based on its diameter versus its length. So we're not going to get really involved in that, just so you understand that you know there is a lot of math involved and engineering involved in a lot of these building systems and that's where it's, it's critical that, um, especially under construction, um, these buildings are, a lot of the elements are certified by a, a licensed engineer or architect. So that's one of the reasons why we always require building permits when anything is built, there's any type of uh, additions, renovations done. So those things are very important when it comes into building construction. And, and our safety when we're dealing with you know possible collapse of fires. But uh, just going forward with this, um, this is a three-inch concrete filled lally column it's split in the center. All right. Um, there are other loads and forces in play. Concentrate a load above. Uh, just to get back, the floor above was carrying two 100 gallon or more hot water heaters. Plus they had all their uh, cases of uh, beer for the bar over top of this uh, bar area on the second floor and the column was undersized. So the the math for this is called Euler's critical load. So um, just so you're aware there there is you know there, there is criteria out there for column size of columns, length of columns. So just go back to uh, what was happening here um, we went in as a technical rescue team. Uh, we are shoring up the girder. So we're, we're replacing that column that snapped. Uh, there are two posts dated shore over here. There's another picture, another two posts in shore. So we're basically replacing the column. We're carrying the load just to make the building safe um, so we can get it uh, structural engineer in there to take a look at it and then give them a plan to uh, reinforce it, rebuild it. So that would be a double T, replace the lally column. <clears throat> and that column would have been under an axial load. So axial load, load 
is straight down the center of the column. If anybody's familiar with uh, Paratech struts or any type of strut in uh, the USOR world, um, over here to the right, we have a gray Paratech strut. And again, it's under an axial load. And the strut at this parking garage incident support the concrete beam. Uh, the strut is basically a column that transfers load to the foundation. The longer the strut, the less load can support. Again, going back to that Euler's principle, uh, so even our rescue equipment um, has issues based on length versus uh, the size of the column. So this would be a table from uh, Paratech based on the, the struts. And again, if you're familiar with uh, Paratech struts based on a safety factor, as you increase the length of the strut, you decrease the, car the carrying capacity. Eccentric loads, so same thing with a column. However, the load on a column is off center. Column is still in compression, but it's off center. So here are two columns, right? They're both what we call H columns. So columns are not I beams. I beams are totally different. I beam is a beam. It's called an I beam because it's the shape of an I. A steel H column is in the shape of an H. So the column on the left, the load is an axial load. It goes straight through the center. All right. The column on the right has a flange welded to it. So this flange may receive a uh, steel bar joist. So the column is actually in an eccentric load. It's off center of the center of the column. Shear loads, uh, a good example of a shear load would be the illustration on the left. Uh, it's a brick veneer wall. It's, it's a non-structural wall. Um, it's basically what they call a curtain wall. And if over time, if the supports start to rot away, you could have a collapse. And the collapse would be a straight down uh, collapse as illustrated would be considered a, a shear load, shear collapse. And again, up here, these two columns slide against each other. Um, load is in shear. An example of that might be this balcony, concrete balcony. It's possibly in shear. Uh, it's attached to the, the building on one wall. Uh, this happened to be an incident where we had a vehicle crash through the building. Uh, it took out some of the concrete block over here. Now, not really sure if this concrete block is supporting or if it is just there for decorative purposes. But uh, as a safety precaution, we threw up a single T, spot T over here, and we threw up a, a two-posted vertical shore over here uh, just to carry the load. A couple more shores inside uh, just to carry the load of the building. So this um, cantilever balcony could possibly be in, in a shear condition. Loads under tension. Uh, different forces are usually in play at all times. But in the tug of war up here, the rope is in tension. Right? It's a pulling force. Down here, we have a steel roll bar truss. Now, there's different forces in play when we talk about this truss. The top cord is in compression. So when we talk about trusses, right, the top part of the truss is called a cord. That's in compression. The bottom part is called a cord. The bottom cord is in tension. So there's two uh, forces in play when we're talking about trusses. One thing about trusses, there should be no substantial load hung off the bottom cord of the truss. All the weight the weight is supported up on the top cord. So if you run into a uh, you know, in-service inspection and you see trusses and they're hanging some type of heavy mechanical equipment from the bottom cord, uh, you may want to contact your fire inspector, your fire official, your building code official, and say, hey, listen, something doesn't look right. 
Um, can you go out and check it? Because again, we're taking the all the all the weight is loaded on the top cord. <clears throat> if you go out and look at some of the buildings that are sprinkled in your area, all the sprinkler piping is hung from the top cord, not the bottom. So just a, something to keep in mind. Impact load, right? Impact load is a load that's delivered um, relatively fast into a concentrated point. So in this case, we have a firefighter jumps off the ladder onto the roof and he may just cause a collapse. All right, so here's a video I took off uh, YouTube. And if you watch the upper, towards the upper right of the screen, the first couple of seconds, uh, you'll have to look very closely, but you'll see a firefighter walking around on a roof and all of a sudden he disappears into the building. All right, so that was the, uh, you, you can see him plunge through the roof. Um, the backstory is he actually fell right through the building and walked out the front door. So he wasn't, uh, he wasn't significantly injured. All right, another impact load uh, video. And again, from a fire officer standpoint, um, fire incident commander standpoint, why is this guy even up here? Why would you allow this firefighter to be up on this roof doesn't make any sense to me and you can see what happens to him. He turned on the roof of this garage sent him to make ventilation holes when just 23 seconds later the roof collapses and flames explode out. All right so you need to draw your own conclusions on that but you know I have my own um I don't think I would have sent that guy up there for there was no reason to be up there but <clears throat> That's what happened. Let's talk about dead loads. So dead loads are parts of the building, right? They, they're the physical parts of the building um, that are, you know, that don't move. So up here we have, uh, we're looking across a hospital campus, right? So we have a number of dead loads that we can look at. So over here on the left, we have a, a mechanical, big mechanical piece of equipment for HVAC. All right, another HVAC unit up on the roof, more HVAC chillers and coolers up on the roof, um, penthouses. All right, we have uh, exhaust equipment for uh, emergency generators up here. So all this is called a dead load. It's part of the building. More more equipment down there on a the lower roof. Um, new piece of equipment was just been added to this roof, right? A helipad, right? So there's a lot of structural engineering that goes into this um, this design. Um, is the building capable of carrying the added weight? If not, you know, what has to be done? What what added columns have to be put in to transfer the load of the helipad down to the foundation, right? And again, it's not only the weight of the helipad. Now you're, you're talking about uh, the weight of a helicopter that lands on there, and, and we're talking added snow load, things like that. So, a lot of engineering goes into this. All right, can you spot more dead loads? All right, water tower down here. All right, water tank. More mechanical equipment. sign right sign on this building over here all right so dangers of dead loads right uh rooftop so in this instance there was a fire in this building the fire was pretty much underneath the area where this rooftop unit was located so if you're the roof man you're going up to the roof um, what do you need to do? What do you see? You need to communicate back to the uh, 
you know, your officer, you need to communicate back to the incident commander. Um, that looks like there's a you know, heavy mechanical piece of equipment up on the roof right over top of where the fire is. You can see where it's starting to sag down. The arrow here, this is the uh, where the fire was located in the building. The arrow is basically pointing to where that uh, rooftop unit is uh, on, the, on the, uh, the roof of the building right above the fire area. Concentrated loads. So this was a townhouse uh, complex under construction. Um, what had happened was <clears throat> they were hoisting up the panels here, the gypsum panels for the fire separations. Uh, unfortunately, they they were put, they put everything on top of some wood I beams. There was no floor decking in place yet. And we had a collapse from the third floor down to the first floor. So you can see the, uh, the sheetrock that was loaded onto three or four wood I-beams on the third floor, no decking in place. Um, show some other pictures of some of the issues we had here. Uh, luckily, the, the workers actually rode the load down on top and were not injured. But concentrated load, um, so we're putting a heavy weight in one spot. Uh, very similar to what we talked about before I showed you the, uh, the crab's claw incident with the uh, lally column, the undersized lally column, couldn't support the load. But here, um, these wood I-beams, you, know, you can notch, you can notch and cut the wood I-beams based on the manufacturer's specifications. Right? Um, this was a in-the-field modification, so they could get HVAC ductwork through the uh, I-beams, and from what I could come up with, this was not allowed by the manufacturer. They just they cut away too much material in the wrong spot. Uh, this was systemic throughout this complex. <clears throat> so again, it's important for you as you know, fire officers to get out there and take a look at your buildings, especially when they're under construction. Uh, of course, once, once they button up the framing with the sheet rock and everything, you'll never see that again until it collapses. So again, here's just a uh, picture. Um, again, they notched out all these wood I-beams, passed ductwork through. So in a fire scenario, um, if the fire gets up into the breaches of the sheet rock and gets up into that area, uh, those things are going to burn away relatively quickly, and we have a very high potential of collapse. So you need to get out there and inspect your buildings. All right, live loads. So I want you to take a look at the date down here, February 14th, 1965, early in the morning. Um, this is my town, Tom River. This was the uh, Four Seasons Pool Hall. Right, fire starts up in the pool hall up here. Um, a lot of water put on it. Fire is eventually you know, extinguished. All right. So live loads, in this case, a live load includes water from firefighting. So a live load is pretty much anything that is not considered to be a dead load. So a dead load is part of the building. A live load would be something like uh, furniture, uh, furnishings, um, people, all right? The amount of people that come into the building, they would be considered a live load. Uh, in this case, um, the water from the firefighting is a live load because it's not part of the building. It's being added to the structure. So again, things from a incident commander standpoint is uh, you have multiple streams operating, you have a tower ladder operating, uh, master streams operating. You're putting a lot of water into a building. Um, it's got to start thinking about, hey, is there a potential for collapse because I'm overstressing the structure at this point. So that's one form of a live loop. All right, again, take a look at the date. Almost a year later, right, the building sat vacant for almost a year. Uh, big snowstorm comes through, puts a heavy snow load on the building. Again, snow load is a live load, just like the water uh, for firefighting, you know, just from like rainwater on a roof. 
people in the building it's a live loop so what happens the buildings were weakened by fire um, there's never any uh, renovation to it up until this time uh, snow snow is hard and what happens roof structure that was left collapses the wall collapses uh, down into the parking lot of the this car dealership next to it so live load in this case it's a snow load Okay, parapet wall, we all have these in our areas. Um, so what forces are in play? So as a uh, fire officer, incident commander, you pull up, you see this. Um, again, this should be putting up a, a red flag here. You know, is there a potential uh, collapse? Um, collapse area needs to be set up. You know, what's going to cause this thing to possibly come down? Well, we talk about a torsial load. So a torsial load could also be considered a wind load. So it would be like a side impact load. Um, so in this case, heavy wind condition, um, years and years of uh, neglect for this parapet, all of a sudden a, a storm blows through, the parapet wall collapses. Right. Uh, firefighting, you have a uh, parapet that's struck with a heavy caliber fire stream, collapses. All right, so moving on from loads, we're going to talk about some uh, construction types and use groups. <clears throat> so over on the left, we have various um, construction types. Now these construction types match up with the center column. So uh, fire resistive construction matches up to what we would call in the, in the building construction world a type one. So type one would be fire resistant. Um, if you, can, you can see here there's basically five types of building structure and then you break out into some subsets. So type one construction breaks out into a type 1a or 1b. Uh, a type two construction which is not combustible breaks out into 2a, 2b. Uh, so they all have subsets with the exception of type 4, which is heavy timber. Uh, we'll talk about the subsets in a second. But let's talk about the use groups. Right? So um, when we talk building construction, we not only talk about the types of construction, we also have to have a slight understanding of you know, what is the building used for. So, these are called use groups. So assembly use, right? A church, um, a large restaurant, um, places where people come to assemble. You know, a mall. Um, so <clears throat> um, venues where they may come to listen to concerts or see plays, things like that. Um, auditoriums. They're all assembly uses. Business use, so a business use, obviously offices, um, people come in to conduct business, um, they're not really selling anything, so you're thinking about what's in a business use, you have uh, business furniture, you have you know, paper, tables, chairs, desks, cubicles, things like that you might find in a normal business office setting. So again, things that you need to think about as a fire officer is, what's the building being used for? And based on what the building is being used for, you can also start thinking about what's the fire load. So again, a fire load is the combustibles that are in the building that are going to burn. So educational use, which would be schools, start thinking about fire load. And education use is going to be very low. Uh, versus a factory use, so what's the factory use for? Factory is something where a place where they're going to build things. So what are they building? Are they they're building steel and steel products? So there may be a a very low um, fire load because of the, the steel manufacturing versus a you know place that is doing upholstery with a lot of foam rubber products, um, mattresses, things like that. Institutional use, be some type of medical facility, you know, hospital. Uh, doctor's offices, nursing homes, things like that. 
mercantile, the places that sell stuff. And you go to the Home Depot, it's a mercantile. They sell things. <clears throat> Storage facilities, residential, and high hazard. So anything where there may be uh, quantities of hazardous materials stored. So understanding use groups is very important when we talk building instruction. And again, um, based on the use, they may be limited to the type of construction um, that is allowed. So <clears throat> just things to uh, just keep in the back of your mind as a fire officer. So we talked about uh, the subsets, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. So when we talk about this, we're talking about protected. Right? When I say protected, from a building construction standpoint, I'm not talking about a sprinkler system. I'm not talking about a standpipe system. People seem to think that when they hear the system, they hear the word protected, it means that it has a sprinkler system. It's not true. In building construction um, format, the subsets um, refer to the protection of the bones of the building, the structural members. So a, a type 2A building, the structural members, the the roll bar, floor trusses, the columns, um, they're going to be protected. They're going to be covered with some type of fire resistive material. They may, they may have spray on fireproofing. Um, they may be encased in concrete. They may be wrapped in some type of gypsum. But it's giving that structural member some protection against direct flame contact. Whereas in a type 2 building, type 2B, the bones of the building, the columns, the girders, the roll bar trusses, they are exposed directly to flame contact. There's no, there's no uh, fireproofing or, or fire resistant material um, protecting them against direct flame contact. So that's the the difference when we start talking about protected versus unprotected. So fire resistive. Talk a little bit about fire resistive. Um, the next section, one of the sections coming up is going to be exclusively fire resistive. So we're just going to touch a few things on fire resistive. So fire resistive is, is a non-combustible structure. So the bones of the building don't burn, right? They're made of steel, they're made of concrete. Uh, they're covered in some type of um, fireproofing, fire resistant material. Uh, they may have fire, or a spray on fireproofing, maybe wrapped in some type of uh, con gypsum or concrete. Um, so if you look here, this would be a residential building in my area. Uh, you can see the, uh, the beams, the columns here. They're sprayed on, they're sprayed with fire, fireproofing material. So the bones of his building, they're protected. So we talk about um, building construction. If we look in the uh, building, International Building Code, we can see that a type 1A construction uh, in the yellow, uh, type 1A, a lot of the structural members are required to have three hour protection, all right? Then we go down to 2B, they're, they're required to have two hours protection. So that means that the, the structural member um, can last up to two hours uh, with direct flame contact uh, before it starts to fail. So all these are UL listed um, tests <clears throat> that are done under a laboratory setting. So that's the, when we talk about subsets, um, the A's and the B's, this is where it comes from. And again, you can see the other, other tables over here for type two, type three, type, uh, type five, right? So we get into type five, usually it's either one hour or no, no hours, right? So zero hour. <clears throat> so that's the, when we say protected versus unprotected, we're just saying that the, the bones of the building, structural elements, have some type of fire resistive material placed on them um, 
to give them some time uh, to hold up if exposed to direct flame contact. So fire resistive, we're also looking at um, penetration. So from floor to floor, the any penetrations are sealed with the listed system. So in this case, it's a, a fire stop between floors for uh, vertical chases, vertical conduit. Um, three hour with a three hour cross carter fire door, which is used to separate um, buildings. So in this case, uh, this would be a hospital setting. The, the fire doors here are separating wings of the building. Uh, it also creates a area of refuge. So uh, in a hospital setting, some type of setting like that where the people uh, cannot you know, self-evacuate, we may just move them from one part of the building to the other part of the building. So that would be called putting them into an area of refuge. Uh, also, another another component of fire-resistant construction, uh, self-closing rated stairwells, uh, usually two-hour rating. So once you get into the stairwell, you should be able to make your way down and exit into a, uh, the outside of the building. Okay, this is just a, a quick video that talks about the penetrations in a fire-resistant building. And penetrations need to be sealed in a specific manner with specific material. So there's a UL, UL listings of uh, systems, how things, how penetrations are protected. So. Um, Real quick, we can just see some of the testing that was that was done with properly uh, sealed penetrations versus penetrations that were uh, not done properly. And from a fire officer perspective, fire to the commander perspective, uh, you can see where you're going to get smoke spread, fire spread, fire extension into other parts of the building, you know, through chases, through walls, because of work that was not done properly. results in rapid spread of fire and smoke and demonstrates the importance of matching every detail to the listed system. Even materials with respectable fire problems will not hold up if used inappropriately. The hole for the five conduits on the left uses glass fiber insulation, a material that does well in non-combustibility, but in the event of a fire, softens and yields considerably. Its lack of suitability for this installation allows smoke and hot gases to pass rapidly through the fiberglass stuffed openings. The temptation to use materials already on hand, combined with lack of knowledge, can result in inadequate fire stopping. Here, a common foam-type seal found at most construction sites is used to seal the pipe on the left. There are no tested and listed fire stop systems using these common foam seals for fire resistance. The foam seal Right, a fire stop system was installed in accordance with the system listing, and fire and smoke passage were completely prevented, as expected. The fire safety danger of using readily available materials far outweighs the danger. Okay, let's see, I went a little too far. I'll go back to this. Final scenario shows the critical importance of correctly fire stopped top of wall joints. This schematic shows a plan view of the test setup. The compliant and non compliant joints are located next to closed in areas to simulate adjacent corridors, which are often critical for effective egress. The non compliant top of wall joint seals are ineffective and allow massive amounts of hot smoke to move through the unprotected joints quickly filling the space on the non-fire side of the wall with smoke and hot gases. Conversely, 
the tested, listed, code-compliant joint seals are able to contain the combustion and protect adjacent space. In this situation, safe egress is possible. All right, so the, the last video with the top of wall joints, um, and that can be an issue, especially when you get into um, some of these large buildings that are, are designed for um, different type of businesses. They may be in a, a, a business, um, some type of a <clears throat> business park setting where uh, you may have identical garage spaces and uh, different tenants come in. Um, so there should be a one hour separation between tenants. And if you get a fire in the one tenant space, it's supposed to keep the fire from spreading to the adjacent tenant spaces. But if that uh, top of wall joint isn't properly sealed, you're going to get fire extension into the tenant spaces on you know, either side of the business. So uh, just something to be aware of as a fire officer, that the fire separation you know, between businesses, um, <clears throat> what the possibilities are if you get you know, construction that wasn't up to code. Again, another reason why uh, we really push uh, building inspections and we push you know, permitting, permitting for any type of additions or reconstruction or, or new buildings. So moving on, a non-combustible type 2, again, protected and unprotected. So uh, an unprotected, non-combustible type 2, exposed structural steel members and assemblies. A protected, non-combustible type 2, structural steel members are protected by some type of fireproofing material, usually less than two hours. So when we say non-combustible, it just means that the structural members of the building uh, will not burn. However, remember, the contents of the building will burn. And if the contents of the building, uh, the fire load is heavy enough and the building is not protected um, and you have steel uh, members that are exposed to heat flame, uh, the potential of collapse, at least the localized collapse, um, is very high. So again, just keep that in mind as a fire officer. So here would be a, a type 2 non-combustible uh, ceiling assembly, roof assembly. So we have a metal deck roof on top of steel bar joist trusses, all right, open trusses, unprotected. So we say unprotected, there's no covering on that steel. So any type of flame impingement, uh, you can expect early collapse, uh, at least a, a localized collapse of that, that roof assembly. Uh, a big firefighter killer. So again, um, think twice before sending anybody up on one of these roofs. And again, um, why are you sending guys on this roof? Uh, ventilation is probably not a good option in this scenario. Um, the trusses are set fairly far apart. Uh, you start cutting the steel uh, decking and it, uh, it pitches in, you're setting it yourself up to have somebody fall into the actual fire area. <clears throat> so again, it's not really recommended to do ventilation on this type of structure. Um, try to knock the fire down with the reach of the hose stream. Um, if you need to ventilate, ventilation should be done after the fire is under control. Just a uh, picture of a common, ubiquitous, type 2, unprotected construction complex in anybody's area. Some type of manufacturing, some type of uh, mercantile, some type of business use. <clears throat> but they're, they're out there. They're, they're all over. This would be illustration of a protected non-combustible, the columns, the floor assemblies, the roof assemblies uh, all have some type of protection. Uh, either they're wrapped in some type of gypsum 
Um, they're protected by rated ceiling panels. They may have some spray on fire protection. <clears throat> so again, the building is non combustible. The, the, the bones of the building don't burn, but the materials in the building uh, will burn. Ordinary construction, um, again, can be protected, unprotected. In ordinary construction, uh, the bearing walls are made of some type of, usually made of some type of masonry construction. Floors and roofs are usually made of wood. Uh, the structural members of the bones are usually made of combustible material, right? And the protected uh, ordinary construction, underside of roof assemblies are usually covered with some type of fire resistant material, usually gypsum. Uh, columns may be wrapped in, in gypsum. There may be some spring out fireproofing. So again, you need to get out there, look at your buildings, and sometimes the best time to do that is while they're under construction. Heavy timber construction, also known as mill construction. The, uh, the bones of the building, the structural members, they're large, dimensional, usually eight inch by eight inch. And one of the characteristics is limited concealed spaces. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these buildings were found in the, uh, the Northeast, and they were old mills, old factories, um, built during the Industrial Revolution. A lot of the processes in there um, involve a lot of oils, machine oils, um, urethanes, um, a lot of spillage onto the floors, those materials getting soaked up into the wood. And when they do catch on fire, um, there's a lot of open area, a lot of air that can get into the building, and they'll burn relatively fast and furious. So again, just a picture of a common type 4 mill type building in the northeast. Um, once it gets going, you pretty much have to just contain it to the block or blocks of origin. Wood frame construction, all right. Again, protected, unprotected. Um, big issue with the building code as far as um, once you go up to a third story in wood frame residential construction, it's got to be 5A construction or you got to put in a sprinkler system. <clears throat> so 5A construction usually denotes that the exterior walls are built to a UL standard for one hour fire resistance. Um, again, it depends on the, the building's placement on the lot line. Um, usually anything closer than five feet to a lot line, there's going to be some type of fire resistance required, at least on that wall facing the lot line. Uh, again, if you're going to go over three story, three story or above in a residential, it's going to be 5A construction. So it's going to be more uh, heavier, heavier duty sheetrock placed on the floors and the walls. Again, in lieu of the 5A construction, they can go with the residential sprinkler system. Um, <clears throat> Right now, uh, some states are requiring new construction, one or two family, to be built with sprinkler systems. Uh, New Jersey right now, uh, it's not required until you go over, until you get up to three stories. If you want to build a residential house at three stories, you can do a 5A construction or you can do, put in a residential sprinkler system. So wood frame a lot of times is made to look like stone or masonry, and you can be confused. You can pull up to this building as a fire officer and think you have a, an ordinary constructed building. Uh, walls may look like they're masonry, but they're not. Uh, this is just a stucco siding, and this is a wood frame building. Same thing down here. Wood frame building. They're trying to make it look like it's a, a masonry construction. And again, you can be confused um, as a fire officer given a size up on this building. So again, you got to get out there, know your buildings, do your inspections. Uh, wood frame construction, lightweight construction. 
uh, we will deal with lightweight construction. All right. And this fire up here, this was a fatal fire. Um, the fire starts in the basement. There was a delayed um, call to the fire department. Occupants tried to put the fire out themselves. The woman that was located, it was a, a woman was up here on the first floor trying to find her dog. The the initial company is making a just just made a push in um, because they knew she was in there. This individual here just came out. He received. He's standing there because he just received some uh, burns um, to his uh, to his neck and ears, and arms, because he uh, he made it in a few feet in order to try to make a grab, and then they backed out. Uh, as soon as they backed out, the entire floor assembly uh, collapsed into the basement. Pretty much, it looks similar to this. Uh, unprotected wood I-beams, all right? So there's no protection on these wood I-beams. Um, this is not an actual picture from this construction, uh, but it does show some of the hierarchy of building structure. Again, we have a column. In this case, this girder is wrapped in gypsum. Uh, why just the girder is wrapped in gypsum, I don't know, uh, but it just is a good picture to illustrate the wood I-beams. Again, the beams are being carried on the girder, and the loads are transferred down to the column. But these wood eye beams, there's no protection. There's no sheetrock on these. So once the fire gets started, uh, these are going to burn relatively quickly, and collapses, you know, imminent. The one good thing in the uh, 2018 building code, the change requires now that wood eye beams in basements to be protected by gypsum or they have to be dimensional lumber, you know, two by eight, two by 10. Fire areas and separations, based on the occupancy, based on the type of construction, we're gonna separate areas of buildings. This happens to be a two family structure. And again, one, one side of the building is separated with a two-hour fire separation using gypsum. So we have one, one family over here, we have another family over here. <clears throat> That's double fire base gypsum gives us a two-hour rating. And this is this is what it would look like over here. So yeah. The fire starts on one side as long as this fire separation hasn't been penetrated. Fire should stay on this side, not get into this side. Um, I will show you some issues that we have problems with with townhouses when we get into the, um, the Type 5 construction. There, there is an Achilles heel with this type of uh, construction, but I'll wait till we get to that point. Again, fire areas and separations, in this case townhouses. Um, here is the townhouse unit that we showed before that had to collapse. And again, these units are separated with two hour fire separations. So the, uh, the gypsum is between dwelling units. So this is, this is one townhouse. This is another townhouse, right? So on and so forth. They're all separated with two hour fire separations. And again, when we get into the, uh, the 5A construction, uh, I do have a, a fire scenario that I'm going to show <clears throat> that's, that's related to this slide up here, but I will show you Achilles heel with some of the, uh, the construction with the townhouse construction. So in this case, we talk about um, fire separation and, you know, they missed, apparently during construction, they missed this section of gypsum. But again, I'll, this will be illustrated further in another another portion of the program. Old school apartment buildings, you can see the fire separation, all right? So possibly, let me go back to that. In this case, we're possibly setting off two, an apartment up here, 
an apartment down here. So two units, two units, right? There's a uh, the exterior uh, cladding on the building is brick veneer. So uh, again, it has an inherent fire resistive uh, material, brick veneer, um, limited fire spread. So definitely, you know, good buildings to do firefighting in. Um, old school construction, probably more more likely than not, it's two by six rafters versus a, a wood truss. So substantial, uh, you know, substantial um, lumber up here that you can stand on. How to do any type of roof ventilation? <clears throat> this is this would normally be a brick or block separations. So pretty substantial. So again, the fire areas and separations. And in this case, commercial, we're going to separate use groups. So in this case, we talked about use groups before earlier. So this is a three hour fire separation. So on the right, we have an assembly use. So this is a hotel complex. So on the right, we have the ballrooms, the bar area, uh, kitchen, and it's separated from the residential side. In this case, it's, it's an R1 use. So the residential side and the assembly use side are separated by three hour fire separation. So basically they're two separate buildings. We go a little further, each floor area of the residential use, the R1 use, is separated from the other floor areas. So again, one hour uh, rated separation, one hour rated separation, one hour rated separation. So all the floors are separated into fire areas. And this is just a picture inside the lobby. So we're going from the assembled use now into the residential use. And up above here, there is a three hour fire shutter that would roll down that would separate the use. Now, from a fire officer standpoint, if you know there's a roll down fire shutter here, what happens if you start dragging hose line through and this fire shutter comes down possibly cut off your water supply so again just keep that in the back of your mind when you get out there and inspect the buildings <clears throat> know what it's there for know what it does uh, vertical separations we get into residential buildings so what's the separation in the vertical realm here all right these balconies are considered separations, right? One hour fire separation. So fire rolling out this sliding glass door is gonna come up. It's gonna hit the underside of this concrete balcony. It's gonna be deflected up. So that's considered a separation. So it just doesn't lap straight up into the other window, up into the other window, or not window, but sliding glass door. So in this case, where's the vertical separation? The vertical separation ha happens to be the glass is rated, right? It has a three hour, three quarter hour glazing. So when we say glazing, we're talking about windows. So there is a rating of these windows. So if we had a car fire here, um, this glass does have a fire rating to it to keep fire from extending into the building for a short period of time. Usually by that time the fire department should be on location to be able to extinguish the fire. <clears throat> so where's the separation? All right. This interstellar space here between floors, that's considered a separation. All right, so fire lapping up here. Um, there is a distance before it gets to the windows above. It's an acceptable separation. 30 inch as rated at one hour. Okay, so this is not a tactics class, but um, I you know, want you to think as a fire officer, 
So if you look at this building, you see a potential problem. And I'm looking at the fact that these are air conditioning units or spaces for air conditioning units. So have we negated the one hour fire rating by putting air conditioning units in there? Um, that would be one of the questions I would have to ask and would be suspect to has the rating reduced. So if I had if I had fire coming out of windows here, could I get extension into the air conditioning unit right here? So just questions you need to ask yourself. And again, you can go out in your area, inspect your buildings, do inspections. Again, sometimes the best time is when a building is under construction. Uh, you can see what's behind the walls. So some takeaways from this section. Uh, there are five basic building construction types. Um, fire behavior can react differently based on the building construction in regards to fire spread, fuel loads, and collapse, just to name a few. Understand the different types of loads that are placed on buildings, and understand how fire separation can work in your favor, but anticipate extension beyond that. So here's my info. Um, and again, this is part of the building construction class for the anyone that needs the course for the New Jersey Division of Fire Safety for the Fire Officer Certification. Um, it's part of the Google Classroom building construction class that we are, are conducting. Um, so any questions, uh, give me a call, send me an email. And we'll talk to you in part two.